Hi, is this uh, Lear or Ma Mason? That's me. Hey, this is uh, Maddie from Madness to Creation. How you doing, man? Good, how you doing, Maddie? Oh, doing pretty well. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to interview with me and stuff. And just kind of a rainy day and stuff like that. How's your day going so far? Pretty good so far. I'm just trying to get some caffeine in my blood so you're not talking to a dentist. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It... Oh, uh, May City, well, you know, it's it has its strange days and all that stuff. You know, Um just kind of living it up in Iowa as much as you can. Um, and you're from, uh, is it, you're from Phoenix, right? Yeah, Phoenix right now. Okay. Um, yeah, so tell me about, like, uh, we'll start off the interview that way. Um, tell me about, like, the, um, how everything's been going in Phoenix. Um, I read that uh, some, are some places, like, closing due to COVID-19 in Arizona now due to spiking cases? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a spike in cases here right now, and um, I guess it's just one of those things where a lot of people got optimistic that we might be able to kind of go back to business as usual and start doing normal things again if we were careful, but uh, it doesn't seem like people are being careful enough with reopening it, so yeah, it's a little scary to see those numbers. Yeah, absolutely it is. And how have you been coping, like, through the lockdown and all, and all that? Like, um, how have, like, you have adjusted your uh, social media? Yeah, well, it was kind of a safe approach for the way the year's gone for me, too, because uh, I started the year with a real plan to, you know, as many artists did, I think, going into 2020, launch my album, uh, you know, you know, do the do the cycle, get stuff out there, do social media, start booking some shows, and just kind of you know do the normal things you do when you're a band. But um, that quickly, you know, quickly realized that wasn't going to happen, and um, so then the focus kind of shifted really to um, you know what can I still get done, and that was actually kind of a very frustrating thing for me initially uh, mm -hmm. because I knew the lockdown was the right thing to do. But it also uh, creatively created a lot of frustration for me because I, you know, typically will set goals with things like video productions and uh, you know recording and just this, the goals you set as a band, uh, the things you want to accomplish creatively, and then you know not being able to uh, get together with bandmates and not be able to get crews together to film videos, and uh, you know I hit a very like frustrating low point where kind of started to freak out a little bit thinking like you know all these expectations I had I wasn't going to be able to achieve but then gradually I realized that you know you can give those things a little time you know mm -hmm. they don't they don't I don't have to control everything right like the, the schedule is only my own schedule and if we push some things back and wait till the world's a safer place uh, that's not gonna it's not gonna harm anything it's not it's certainly not gonna harm the art or the music to so just wait and put it out at the right time yeah absolutely do you do you feel like on a personal level it um it helped uh with your focus or did it hurt your focus or it, did it help you become like more resilient through the process i would say that um i kind of went into like a somewhat of a panic mode followed by somewhat of a depression where oh man uh you know, my girlfriend could attempt to, I was just kind of freaking out. Like I didn't know what to do with myself. Almost just kind of like a miserable day to day, like, okay, but we're locked down and I can't do anything. Um, just creatively, you know, this is not saying I want to go out and drop some things or even concerts, but um, like I said, not being able to, to work and, and produce, um, which is my day to day. Like I'm just working and creating every day. So, you know, just knowing I'd be, locked at home and trying to figure out how to how to cope with all that was definitely a challenge at first um but yeah i, I managed to find a creative group in there which is you know just that you're able to if you look at it the right way this is actually a really good time to be able to focus and really work on something kind of up without all the normal um everyday things that kind of flood your brain when you're in, you know, everyday high functioning society. So it's kind of a good opportunity to just take a step back and and uh, work in the studio and just do the things that I could still do and take my time doing it. Yeah, 
Yeah, do you feel like uh, through this lockdown and stuff, do you feel like uh, concerts are going to be better than ever before? And do you feel like uh, people's music is going to be better than ever before? I think that um, you know, it's almost like when you take something away, that from people, then they realize how much they want it or enjoy it or even need it. So I think live concerts are going to be bad for people. I know that a lot of artists are um, you know, doing the, I'm going to play acoustic guitar from home on my webcam thing and trying to do, you know, socially distanced um, across the country. Everyone's logged in and playing their instruments together, things like that. But there's just no substitute for the energy and the experience of a real live concert. And I think, I think even though, um, you know, a lot of people are putting in good effort and, you know, People seem to be enjoying consuming that kind of content. I think it is also making us realize that when concerts come back, it's going to be something that we all really need in our lives. Whether you know whether we have to wait a little bit longer for it, that's okay. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of concerts, um, what is like your favorite uh, like memory that you have playing live? And um, and what is that feeling like when fans come up to you and, and say, like, hey, your music helped me get through a tough time and stuff like that? That, that to me, is probably the most important thing about playing live. It's just, you know, you write and you record music and you, there's a certain amount of personal therapeutic nature that goes into it. Like, these, the songs for me are kind of a confessional. Like, everything I write is very you know, from a, a very inward place, a very inward perspective. So uh, being able to put stuff like that out there and then have someone kind of come up to you and tell you that they really connected with it is kind of the ultimate reward. It's where you know that, okay, this, this paid off if it's resonated with someone. Um, and, you know, to answer your, your first part of that question, uh, I, I think back to... Uh, in my previous band, we had done a kind of a big shift from being a heavier band into getting into some less heavy material and things and uh, kind of leaning more into the post-punk style of, uh, and new wave style of things. And as we started to do that shift, um, I think looking out in the crowd, you can see people are looking at these guys expected us to be heavy. And uh, one of the nights we came out at a, a cover of Love Song by The Cure, uh, which is something you know, was expected to be in our catalog previously. And that, that, that kind of stands up that I really enjoyed because because uh, I did have some people come up to me after that talking about, you know, things, different things they enjoyed from the set. And uh, it, it was kind of a way for me to tread new territory. So that, that was really interesting. You know, doing a cover like Love Song or, you know, The Cure's material really, I think, segues nicely into what I'm doing now on Days of Dunker. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I previewed a couple of your tracks, uh, Wolves and Restless Tides, and I definitely got like a, a Nick Cave meets uh, The Cure with a little touch of like um, some like um, jazzy singer songwriter stuff. Uh, and um, I was going to say, speaking of covers, uh, you have a cover for uh, on your upcoming album for Love and Truth called Ain't No Sunshine by Bill Withers. Um, uh-huh. Out of all those songs, uh, why did you pick that song? And um, like, just uh, take us into that song and that cover. Sure, yeah. So um, I have kind of a long list of covers where songs just sort of strike me at different moments, and I think, oh, this would be a great song to add to the set, you know. And um, and sometimes I'll get a I'll get a text from somebody or a note saying, hey, you should really cover this song or that song because they you know, think it will work with my voice or something like that. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned jazzy singers because uh, I do spend a lot of time going back into old soul and um, and jazz singers, um, you know, Billy Holiday and stuff like that. And of course, Bill Withers comes up a lot of Motown, just consume a lot of Motown too. And um, we're actually in the car one day uh, coming back from San Diego on a road trip. We had a, a playlist going, and um, it was based on Amy Winehouse and a bunch of other jazz and soul singers. And uh, Ain't No Sunshine came on, 
And the instant the song started, within the first few notes, my girlfriend just said, I love this song. And the song is so simple and so short, but so emotional. That to me, that was kind of a perfect, like it's just a perfect uh, thing to add to the Some Days Are Darker catalog because I love the, the brevity of it combined with how emotional it is. And, you know, just that idea that, like you said, like about people coming up to you and telling you the song meant something to you, you know, that you hear the first couple bars of the song and you just emotionally feel it, you know, mm-hmm. almost immediately. So to me, I thought, you know, it's, just seems like a really interesting song to explore. Oh, absolutely. And and God bless his soul, you know. I mean, Bill Withers is just an all-time classic to me. And um, I was going to ask you, like, yeah. um, speaking of, like, your playlist and the, the song that you are you were talking about there, have you considered, do, um, like, Rod Stewart did, like, a like a Great American Songbook where he went through older songs and put his twist on it. Have you considered doing that, like, for Some Days Are Darker in the Future? Or has that crossed your mind? You know, it hasn't crossed my mind, but I, I think it's a very interesting idea that I, I, I'm very receptive to. Um, similarly, you know, I'm a big Danzig fan, but also a big Elvis fan. Oh, and that's interesting. Danzig recently, <laughs> Danzig recently put out that Elvis cover album. Have you heard this? I have not. Yes, Danzig just did an album of Elvis covers, and I'm actually <sighs> terrified to listen to it because... I love Danzig and I love Elvis, and I just don't know if I want to hear those two things together. <laughs> Dude, that so. that that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Uh, let me know what you think. Maybe you're braver than me. Um, I'll 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 put on my brave face and I'll give it a shot. Maybe I'll do like a reaction <laughs> video or something like that. Um, <laughs> right. so what songs did Danzig cover? Was it like? Uh, just like his popular songs, or was it like Heartbreak Hotel? It's kind of a combination of, of popular songs and deep cuts. So I've, I've had a few friends, um, you know, that are also big and big Misfits fans, but love Elvis Presley because all our dads played us a lot of Elvis Presley when we were kids. And, uh, they've dabbled and said it was good. I just, you know, haven't been brave enough yet. So we'll see. I'm afraid it's going to give me nightmares if I try it but oh uh, whatever you know i got a couple days off so i can i'll catch up on sleep sometime so um yeah exactly yeah i was gonna say <laughs> i was gonna say like um uh, a couple of your singles that you released uh wolves and restless tides um wolves has just this incredibly dark moody feel to it and um it kind of reminds me of like when you uh for some reason i envision like the post zombie apocalypse for some unknown reason like we're in an abandoned building um are you ever going to get that song on like uh any like tv placements or movie placements or anything like that because i think it would be perfect for that yeah it's really interesting that you say that because um it is a it is a psychology that i've explored often uh and in various songs um before even before wolf dance and of um very bleak kind of uh, apocalyptical places that you might find yourself in, whether that's, you know, physically apocalyptic or more kind of morally apocalyptic, as in, like, some kind of major life change that you're not sure you're ready for. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would love to license some of these songs, and uh, it's actually something I'm looking into. I've always been uh, a big fan of um, movie soundtracks, film soundtracks, TV, and uh, it would be... uh, I, I occasionally will write a song, you know, almost thinking of it like a score for a film. So yeah, it's something that does interest me. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, like, I would maybe also add to that that I've, I've discovered a lot of great artists. I'm sure you have, um, by watching movies. Oh, what is, tell me a couple artists that you discovered. Uh, I remember in particular hearing Fever Red. Uh, I believe it was on, a TV show may have been True Blood. It's kind of one of those things where you're watching a show and a song comes into the show or the, or the film and the mood is so perfect and you just need like, you need to know who is this artist. I remember that uh, in particular being Fever Ray for me and then discovering the first Fever Ray record, which is fantastic 
movie album, one of my favorites. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I was going to say, like, um, I remember, like, um, there's a band called Joan Red, and, um, like, the lead singer, um, unfortunately, he died um, from a drug overdose. And um, I think it was a drug overdose, but I'll leave that off the record, that part off the record. But, anyways, um, he, uh, like, all of a sudden, like, their song, like, a few years after he died, was he was, like, the biggest football fan, was as it was going to commercials of the Super Bowl. And to me, that just kind of, with him as much as he loved football and stuff like that, that just kind of, it gave me the chills, kind of, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. Yeah, um, that kind of thing happens. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, an, an artist or a band can get a song in a film and it just sparks a career or you can reignite the career. And mostly for me, I just think, um, the two mediums are so powerful in film and, and records to me are just my go-to art mediums, right? It's the things I consume the most are films and records. So to, to be able to entwine those two things, is, is pretty fantastic. Oh, absolutely. And I was going to say, like, um, speaking of film and TV, um, where, uh, what film or TV show do you see your music um, in? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, I heard that I actually, like a lot of people, discovered Michael Kiwanuka through HBO because he did the Big Little Lies theme. And uh, are you familiar with his stuff? Actually, I'm not. Yeah, he's an English uh, R&B soul writer, and he's got this amazing track that they use for Big Little Lies and uh, actually my drummer brought it to my attention one night when we were discussing uh, different production different ways to go with record production and kind of like soulful instrumentation and things and discovered him so that's a long way of me saying uh, I think there's probably a lot of HBO stuff uh, that it would work on one of my all time favorites is uh, The Leftovers nice. because um, they really lean into that idea of kind of coping human suffering and coping and uh, uncertainty and I think probably lyrically and you know like the moods you described for Wolves and Restless Eyes could probably you know find a home pretty nicely in a show like that or a show that covers those same types of things oh absolutely and um so the release is coming up at the end of July um what a, um just kind of a couple more questions before I let you go what are a couple of things that you uh what are a couple of things that you're going to do to promote it? And I, I get it with like uh, COVID and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's been, it's been really tricky. Um, been talking to a few people such as yourself, uh, you know, have a few interviews lined up and just people that want to talk to me about the record, which is really great because I could, you know, talk at length about not really only my own music, but just music in general, you know, just talk for hours. So, I have some of that stuff going on, which is great. I have a um, video for Take Me Anywhere, which is complete, and that's going to be coming out on July 9th. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and uh, so I'm excited about that. It's, it's uh, been in the can for quite a while throughout COVID, but now that we uh, are finally getting things out there, and the album will be out in July. So Take Me Anywhere will be out July 9th, uh, the video. And then... Um, you know, at this point, without being able to play out at things, um, I'll probably be focusing on demos and kind of pre-production for the next record. But I am also um, in the process of a video for Ain't No Sunshine. So hopefully that will be out shortly after the record. I, I have a feeling that that cover is going to... Um, it seems like nowadays covers go viral. I have a feeling that cover is going to go viral. Um, just based upon the two singles that I've heard and stuff like that. So, um, what can um, speaking of "Take Me Anywhere," what, what can fans expect from that uh, video? Uh, the "Take Me Anywhere" video, in some ways, is almost like part of an anthology that the Wolves video lives in. So you'll see some of the same kind of things that occurred in Wolves, almost like uh, a, a next chapter. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so what else would you like? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, uh, the 
part that might be relevant to your interest is it also kind of uh, explores some um, struggles of the mind, I guess you'd say, which, without getting too much away, I think will be apparent to the viewer. Sounds good, and um, yeah, I think that's something that we all agree. And um, what else would you like to add in regards to some days are darker? Awesome, and where can people? Okay, and where can people find you guys? Um, are you talking about online? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the website is sundaysforjoker.com, but uh, you can also find uh, several videos that are out now on YouTube. Uh, YouTube slash Sundays for Darker. And we have an Instagram as well and a Facebook account, so you can connect with us in all those places. That sounds awesome, Lear. And um, Lear, this was yeah. a lot of fun. And thank you so much for uh, talking to Madness Creation, where we talk about music and mental health. So it's it's certainly appreciated. Yeah, for sure, man. I actually kind of wanted to ask you: Are you the are you the guy? You're the this is your site, or are you a writer of the site, or how's it work? Oh yeah, good question. I'm I'm an editor of the site. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just some pretty, pretty big team, or what? Well, um, I have, um, naturally, like, um, I have some photographers, but it's kind of hard to keep them working when there's no shows going on, but, um, yeah. and I have photographers all on the East Coast. Um, I partnered up with my cousin who runs a Don's Hit List podcast, um, and his podcast is aired in United Kingdom, Florida, and obviously online, <laughs> and, uh, um, oh, yeah. And um, I have a couple contributors out of Czech Republic, and I have a couple contributors out of United Kingdom as well. And I'm working on getting somebody from Thailand as well. Oh, right on. Yeah, I've been checking out your site. It's a really interesting model that you guys have to cover music, but also cover kind of the you know, mental struggles that people go through as well. Because you know, so, I think those two things really, music is so therapeutic for people. Oh, yeah, and that is so humbling for you to say that and stuff because um, it was just kind of a vision that I've had. Um, recently, I had, uh, um, like, in, in my life, I've had, like, one of my good friends, he took his own life, and um, and I also teach. I teach special needs kids, and one of the students I had, his brother took his own life uh, last year, or the year before, I should say, and, and I lost a high school classmate recently. He took his own life, too, so... Um, it's just kind of one of those things I feel like it needs to be addressed and people need to have normal conversations about it, like conversations that are as easy as like, hey, I broke my leg last week or I cut myself like shaving or whatever, you know, and yeah, you know, no, I'm really sorry to hear that about your friends and actually, you know, for I sure, man, a, I gave kind of kind of a flat non-answer to your last question if there's anything I'd like people to know, but if I could maybe spin that from a different angle, I would say that um, that music for me has always been very therapeutic. Um, like as a musician, even just playing and writing the songs makes me feel better after, even if I'm just sitting in the studio alone with an acoustic guitar and I'm, I'm writing lyrics and I'm just singing out these parts as I feel that we're trying to figure out the song. Those moments for me are very therapeutic because I'm working out like things that I'm struggling with internally. And I think on the flip side of that, music fans, as you know, and I consider myself one of the biggest music fans out there, you know, we consume so much music and it's all based on the mood we're in and what we need, right? If, if we're feeling good, we want this music that's going to make us feel good. When we're feeling terrible, we want these records that are going to help console us so that are going to relate to what we're going through is angry music that helps people through difficult times and makes them stronger. You know, all of those things are, are all wrapped up in, I think, how therapeutic the whole process and cycle of music is for everyone. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, it's just, yeah, music has gotten me, I can think of like songs and albums that help, help me get through, like when I go through my anxiety and my depression and stuff. And, um, you know, it, yeah. you know, and I think all of us, no matter who we are, are fighting something. 
And, um, you know, whether it's Eddie, whether it's depression, whether it's being scared of something, you know, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all humans just trying to get through this life. And, um, and like, after like hearing about Chris Cornell, Chester Bennington, and I looked at my side and I'm like, no more, I'm going to do what I can to, um, make sure that people talk about these mental health conversations and talk about the music as well. And cause I, I feel it's even therapeutic for the artists when they interview with me, you know, and, you know, and stuff like that. So. Yeah, definitely. You just get to uh, air a lot of things that you may not have realized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, very cool, man. Appreciate the work. Uh, I have one final question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Are you anywhere? Are you anywhere near Marshalltown? Um, I am about an hour away from there, actually. An hour, hour and a half, I would say. Are you a Modern Life is War fan? Um, yeah, they're actually really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're one of my, one of my all-time favorites. You got all their vinyls here. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was... And oh, I absolutely. I Iowa on the phone, and I'm like, Iowa makes me think of, well, probably Slipknot, but mostly Modern Life is War. Yeah, I was going to say, like, we get the, um, half the time people ask me, do you know the guys that slip not? And I'm like, I have no idea who they are. And I interviewed uh, Lou Brutus as well. And, um, oh, he gave me all kinds of crap because I'm, he's like, uh, you're the only I one that I know of that has never seen slip not in concert. I'm like, I haven't got around to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. yeah. Cool. Just another example of just music connects people, you know? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Lear, um, what if, if anything? If you ever need anything, just um, like, just holler, and I, I'd like to uh, chat again sometime. Yeah, yeah. Been great, though. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, and you have a good day. And hopefully, get some other interviews and stuff to get your name out there. Very cool, man. Thanks, I appreciate it. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. And um, tell Monica hello for me. She, you have an awesome PR agent, so she's great to work with. Thanks, man. Yeah, she's really been kicking ass. Actually, I, I have uh, I have two more calls in the next three days after this one, and then a bunch of other stuff lined up. So hopefully that'll uh, hopefully that'll help Love and Truth get some traction, even though I can't play it live yet. Oh yeah, and yeah, she's gonna get that traction for you. Um, I mean, she helped Tool get out there, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, man. Very cool. Well, yeah, I'll definitely uh, say hello for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Okay, man. It's been great. Take care. Yeah, it's been great. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.